submucosa. All vessels in here a little stronger, so denser connective tissue, a little more collagen in there, uh, and then just elastic fibers are, are spread throughout there, but always blood vessels and submucosa. Muscularis externa, this is what provides strength. This is what's going to allow for peristalsis, segmentation, all of that. Movement of food bolus is always going to be done by muscularis externa, and you're always going to have uh, two layers to it, always intercircular, always outer longitudinal, and it's innervated by vagus nerve. Remember, the upper one-third, voluntary. The lower two-thirds, involuntary. Why? Smooth muscle. See, as soon as you see smooth muscle, you can't control that. It's involuntary. And then we have adventitia because it's outside of the peritoneum, so that's why we have adventitia. It's just more for adherence. Lamin appropria can, for us, I think we say no. It does, it has to, but for us, we say no. Like, just learn that in submucosa because the ones in lamin appropria are extremely tiny, so you're really not gonna be able to see them. And it's gonna matter when we get down and talking to the stomach. Like, for example, when you have like an ulcer, you have to penetrate through all these layers and reach here to have a bleeding ulcer, to reach submucosa to have a bleeding ulcer. <clears throat> But there definitely is in lamina appropria because it has to provide nutrition to the basal cells of the epithelium. Welcome. So here, we basically, we took the esophagus, we cut it, and we're looking down through it. So here's the lumen in the center here. And then you can see all the different layers throughout here, mucosa, submucosa, lamina appropria is very thin. You can't really see it, okay? And then the muscularis externa and then adventitia. Yes, all retroperitoneal has adventitia. So how does it get controlled? Through the vagus nerve, controlling the myoenteric plexus, um, and that is what is allowing for peristalsis to happen through the uh, muscularis externa through those two layers, the inner circular, outer longitudinal. So that being said, the esophagus is just a tunnel. It is a pathway. That's all its purpose serves is to take the food that you've been you've taken in and get it to the stomach where we can start to work on it. Have we started breaking anything down? Is there any food source that we've started breaking down already? You sure? Oh, carbs. How are we breaking down carbs? We've started breaking down carbs. Saliva. What in saliva? Amylase. So is there chemical digestion in the esophagus? Yes, technically, because the carbs are coming through with the amylase and they're traveling through. Technically, there is some. Okay. Don't oh, forget about that amylase. Oh, it's not tricky. We're just making you think. Yes, very small amount. It travels pretty quickly through there. Okay. Um, all right. So as far as the uh, hiatus here, if there is laxity or weakness, lack of contraction, that's also termed as laxity of the LES or the lower esophageal sphincter, you can get GERD, gastroesophageal reflux disease. It's not secreting any enzymes, correct? Uh, more, more so you don't choke. You don't swallow too, something too big. That's all. Right? <laughs> That's all. But in reality, the amount of breakdown is minimal. The pancreas and the, the is really the big, uh, for carbs, is really the big player when we talk about amylase. It's minimal in the mouth. Uh, but yeah. So reflux, this is where there's re, uh, relaxation of the LES or laxity of it. And so fluid comes into the esophagus that should not. This is dangerous. It should be dealt with. Uh, so, for example, I take Nexium daily because if that acid keeps on irritating here, the epithelium is going to change over. It's going to change. We're going to have dysplasia, metaplasia, cancer. Uh, um, so that's why it must be dealt with. Otherwise, you develop a proximal esophageal cancer or an adenocarcinoma is what it is called of the esophagus. Um, so that's why it needs to be dealt with. They can go in there and surgically tighten it up. 
problem is it's too tight usually then. So patients have trouble keeping food down. They can actually regurgitate things up uh, so that it's not the most ideal situation. Diaphragmatic uh, hernia. So this is a hernia in the diaphragm over to the side here. Uh, and with this, we can have actually abdominal organs start to come through uh, and it can compress the uh, lungs that are sitting right here and cause issues that need surgical correction. Hiatal hernias, these also can cause reflux, heartburn. Um, so this is where part of the stomach goes through the hiatus. So the LES is now shifted up here, instead of being right here. And that's part of the stomach that is in here. Same thing, it needs to be, this one needs to be surgically treated uh, for, or corrected. Um, otherwise they can develop cancer also. All right, stomach. So, well, we're going to talk about all anatomy, chemical type control. It's kind of the standard as we go through each each section of the GI tract. Okay? So, with the stomach, we have a couple different areas on here. We have cardia, fundus, the body, uh, greater curvature, and lesser curvature. Then we have the pylorus. Okay, sure. I can write it down. <clears throat> well, all right. So with the um, anatomy of the stomach, there's also another unique feature here that we'll talk about and that there's three layers of muscle. We'll look at that. So you have a longitudinal, circular, and oblique layer. Uh, the pyloric sphincter is right here. This is what we were talking about, like an in infant's, newborn's, I should say. Um, sometimes this is too tight. And so what happens is they have a projectile vomit lacking something. What is it lacking? A projectile vomit lacking something. They will shoot out mother's milk. Oh, you guys can't see my cursor? Oh, can't see the little hand moving around? Oh, I'm sitting here pointing everywhere. That is really annoying. Ms. Wong, is there a way to show the cursor anymore? There's no way to show. I can use the pen. Oh, I'll be writing everywhere. Ah, uh, that is irritating. Why would they do that? That's evil. Okay. Where's my pen? Drawing. All right, so I gotta do all this now. Oh man, fun. The hand, that's what I was using. I selected the hand and it wouldn't, you guys weren't seeing it. I didn't realize you weren't seeing it. Mm -hmm. oh, that's what they always do, right? All right, so <coughs> pylorus. So in newborns, this is super tight sometimes. Um, and they projectile vomit. What are they vomiting up? Okay, I, someone, so you said, uh, Gary, chyme, chyme is going to be the mixture of food with acid, so they would be vomiting up chyme. What's coming out down here? There's something coming out down here that they're gonna be missing because this doorway is shut, very tight. So something is not making it out when they vomit. Nutrients are leaving because the nutrients are all in, in the stomach because that's the food. So nutrients are definitely going to be coming out. Bile. Bile. Because bile is going to come into here. Okay. Bile is going to come in here. Um, and, and so when they projectile vomit, it's just the milk coming out. That's usually all we see. Yeah, pancreatic juice technically would be coming out, but really the big thing is the bile. The green is missing. Um, and so that's why they'll projectile vomit it out. Okay. All right. So just like we said before, we've got mucosa, submucosa, muscularis, and serosa. Remember, as we go through each area, look for what's unique. You'll see um, if we have a couple of unique things here. First, gastric pits, gastric glands. That is a unique epithelium. Lamina propria is the same. Muscularis mucosa, it's the same. It's just standard. Submucosa, it's the same. There's blood vessels. 
Um, here, we've got a uniqueness. We have, we should have inner circular, outer longitudinal. Instead, we have middle circular, inner oblique. So we have three layers of uh, muscularis, and then we have serosa, okay? All right, <clears throat> so when we look at the mucosa, we look at the unique structures in those unique cells. Um, we have goblet cells, and I always get students get hung up on this. A goblet cell is just a columnar cell that has the ability to produce mucus. That's all that is. So actually the term comes from, hopefully you guys can see the board pretty decent. So here's your columnar cell. Here is your nucleus, right? The nucleus is typically a little lower in a columnar cell. And what happens is you'll make a, you'll make produce, the cell will produce a mucus vacuole. And eventually that vacuole will the eraser. Why is there no eraser in this group? Hold on here. Reject. Okay. This will get larger and eventually fuse with the cell membrane and it's going to excrete the mucus out. So when you guys look at these, especially in lab, you always look for like one like this and you're like, oh, that's the goblet cell because I can see the mucus. They're all goblet cells and just caught in the moment you see this one. Remember, when you look at slides, that's a picture in time. This cell is always progressing through a process. The reason it's called the goblet is like if you think about the old school uh like wine glasses stuff like that you know back in the day like kings and stuff that's a goblet that's where that term comes from okay they're secreting mucus why do we need mucus it is a layer of protection from the acid because remember the acid will break down the uh, proteins so stomach's made of protein these cells have proteins so we need to protect it so that's our first unique cell the next one, the next unique one is parietal cells. So think uh, P for or pink, uh, P for pink. Parietals are pink. Uh, these are the ones that pump out hydrogen and chloride. And so when they pump that out, they produce HCl. So when we take like a proton pump inhibitor, that's what we're stopping. We're stopping this cell from pumping out the hydrogen. What's a proton pump inhibitor? Nexium omeprazole. Those are proton pump inhibitors. And then intrinsic factor, this guy is also crucial. This is what binds to B12 and allows us to absorb B12. If you're lacking intrinsic factor, which is the only time that it really happens, there's two times uh, that it happens. If you have pernicious anemia, which is an anemia um, that for some reason the parietal cell gets damaged, we stop producing intrinsic factor, or you've had a bypass surgery. Uh, you've had part of your stomach staples removed, uh, then you do not produce in, or have enough parietal cells to produce enough intrinsic factor, you end up B12 deficient. That's really the only population that should be getting B12 injections. Otherwise, it's a waste. You store enough in your body, you get it from your diet. Vegans are the only ones that need to take a um, supplement B12 because they don't eat animal products. Yeah, it, it's the, in those pernicious anemia and stomach bypass surgery, they must get injections. Vegans can take it orally. Other than that, you don't need to be taking B12. You're wasting money if you're taking B12 shots. Don't let a doctor sell you on B12 shots. Waste of money. Okay. Um, <clears throat> our next unique cell, chief cells. So these secrete pepsinogen. We talked about pepsinogen, uh, and it's being activated into pepsin using HCl and that helps break down proteins. Uh, and then we have, so these guys, these three, these first three, these are exocrine. They all secrete out into the lumen. The next ones are uh, enteroendocrine or G cells. These are endocrine cells. So they're gonna secrete into the bloodstream. So first up we have gastrin. Gastrin goes into the bloodstream. It hits the parietal cells. It causes the parietal cells to upregulate their function, make more HCl. Okay. The next one, enterochromaffin cells or EC cells, these secrete serotonin. 
and serotonin travels to the brain and has an effect on causing nausea. So when we talk about things like drugs like Zofran, Zofran is a serotonin blocker, okay? Like when we have an upset stomach, it's not because it's actually upset here, it's because a signal has been communicated to here and that's what causes us to vomit. Um, so that's why we use a 5-HT blocker, I believe that's the serotonin blocker if I remember correctly, <coughs> and um, shuts off the brain from having the need to vomit, right? And then enterochromaffin like cells, okay? These secrete histamine. Histamine has an effect on parietal cells also to cause uh, HCL release. So the older like drugs for heartburn, they were histamine blockers. They don't work as well. Um, they're not as significant. Really, the parietal, uh, sorry, the um, the proton pump itself needs to be shut down in the parietal cell. And so that's where the drugs work on now. So like histamine blockers are like, you know, your Zyrtec, your Claritin, stuff like that. I'm getting a barrage of those like, we tried to reach you about your extended warranty call. Like <laughs> someone from Tennessee called me, now I got California. They even call my work phone. They are just, they are ridiculous, right? All right, so typically um, with these cells, typically the parietal cell is more towards the surface. So what we're looking at here, this is like a uh, gastric pit kind of. Um, and so we're seeing the cells throughout this pit, kind of a pit, okay? We're just gonna go with that. Uh, but usually the parietal cell is more towards the surface because he's releasing the HCL and then chief cells tend to be towards the bottom. When you guys look at the slides in lab, you'll notice clumps of these cells together. I don't think this image is really good to be showing because um, it's kind of confusing. When you look at the slides, it'll make more sense. And the parietal cells tend to be near, near the surface and you'll see chief cells further down. Okay, you'll see little pockets of them. All right, our three layers of the stomach. So we have inner oblique, circular, longitudinal layer. So the inner inner layer is obviously the most superficial or the closest to the lumen of the stomach or closest to the mucosa of the stomach. Um, and what they allow for is when food comes in, we churn it, we mix it with the uh, stomach juice, stomach acid, and it forms chyme. Chyme is that milky substance. Um, after it's been all mixed and it's getting ready to be pumped out of the stomach into duodenum, okay? This is where we're going. So we're gonna burp little bits in so that we can process it. <coughs> yes, through peristalsis. So how do we do that? We create a uh, peristaltic effect or peristal have peristalsis waves come through and we relax the pyloric ever so slightly and some will come in, right? Small amounts. Why small amounts? Because we don't just dump enzyme like crazy. We need to break it down uh, and it's just, we need small amounts to reach all the surface area. Yes, there is air. We swallow air all the time, so there is some air in there. Um, and that's also what generates like gas, flatulence. That's part of the reason. But we swallow a decent amount of air throughout the day, so it's in our stomach, it passes through. As far as gastric juice goes, you produce a decent amount, two to three liters a day. That is a significant amount. Um, and mm, no, I, I wouldn't say that. I wouldn't say that because you still burp somehow. I've gotten hooked on that stuff lately too. So I'm good, I haven't died yet. 
my wife wishes otherwise. <laughs> oh, I almost killed her this weekend. It, it was it was a close call. Almost, almost, almost had success. <laughs> we, were, we were working in the backyard, and we have like a ride in like a hill. And we're taking dirt up to this other area, and we're doing like a planting bed. And so I drove up the head, the bed, or sorry, the hill. I have like a little like trailer behind it with the dirt. And she was behind it, like gave me a little push because the ground was wet, so I wasn't getting good traction. And then, um, what's it called? I like go to switch off the gas to the brakes, and this thing just starts sliding. And of course, her like freezing up. I'm like, move! <laughs> it's like she scurries out of the way. So I almost ran her over. She survived, right? Oh, man, it's good times. Exactly. Deer to headlights. She's like, you know how you just freeze up? I'm like, no, I don't. What is freezing up? Come on. We don't, we don't do that. All right. Anywho, so um, why we need HCL. Okay. Yeah, tuck and roll. <laughs> I'm a winner here, okay? <laughs> um, one of the big things is activating pepsinogen. All right. Uh, I think one of the even bigger things is killing bacteria. How long does food stay in the stomach? A uh, couple hours. It doesn't take too long. Yeah, a couple hours and we empty. Um, it depends on the size of the meal. It depends on what you ate. Uh, all of those play a role in it. But a, a couple of hours. Yeah, I would accept. I would accept three to four, three to five. I would accept that. It's a range. Once again, there's no fixed rule on that kind of stuff. What meal you ate, how big of a meal, what was in the meal, all of that is going to affect it. All right. Um, but yeah, I think killing bacteria is a very big thing um, that we don't even think about because that is a portal into the body. There is tons of bacteria on everything we consume. So it's not, it's not, just, uh, it's not just for breaking, thing, you know, breaking down protein. Really, the big thing is um, sterilizing what we've consumed, all right? And then, like we mentioned, denature protein and forming chyme. All right, hormones that control it. So we've talked about how come we get food poisoning? It's too much bacteria, or we never broke it down fully into chyme. It was still like a solid, and it was inside of the solid and we ingested it, so it made it to the duodenum, or situations like me where I take a Miprazole or Nexium. I lower the amount, of, um, the amount of acid, and so it just kind of puts me at higher risk. There's been new times where I eat something, my wife eats it, she doesn't get sick, I get sick. It's just part of the, part of the regimen of medicine. Um, but yeah. And you only produce so much acid. You eat a big enough meal, there really isn't a lot of acid. You kind of water it down at that point, drinking water, stuff like that. You can start to negate the um, acid a bit. So the hormones, all right? So we talked about, we talked about gastrin. We talked about histamine, all right? Secretin. So this is the new one that we haven't talked about. This one works the opposite, all right? Are they mast cells? Because they, you're asking because they secrete uh, histamine? No. I would say no. I don't think they fall under the same category. They are a separate cell. Good question, though. They may, they could be a specialized mast cell, but I've never come across that. I would say they're a specialized separate cell. I won't say they are mast cells. Um, secretin. So secretin is going to work opposite of everything else. All right. Um, and this is, it's made by the duodenum, secreted by the duodenum. So the duodenum, when acid comes in there, it senses that, and it needs to reduce that acid. It doesn't want acid in there anymore. It's not designed to deal with it like the stomach is. So it releases secretin, and secretin actually works on the pancreas to dump out bicarb buffer, tons of bicarb buffer. We do have mucus lining the duodenum already, 
because we need that protection. There's some acids always coming through. And then when bulk of the chyme comes through, we really need to tame that acid down. Um, so we, we release the cretin from the duodenum. It acts on the pancreas. Pancreas pumps out bicarb, and we start to release really down that acid. And then lastly here, we have CCK or cholecystokinin. And so uh, it is also released by the duodenum. And this causes the gallbladder to contract. It also causes the pancreas to release more enzymes so that we can start to break down all the protein fat, and we should add in there carb, okay? Also include carbs in there. Yeah, that's fine. That shouldn't be a problem. But I would know, I know cholecystokinin is CCK, because what if you get a multiple choice question and you're just looking for CCK, right? Um, and they have it just fully written out. May trip yourself up. So definitely know the word. Yeah. All right. <clears throat> Nervous system. So vagus, which is sympathetic, which is rest and digest, that can cause in anything really with the stomach to full digestion. Um, so the big thing we talk about is acid production. Uh, it helps with that um, that ability of the stomach. Gastrin. Uh, Hi, I'm just gonna say it. Yeah. It's probably easier. Um, in the review for test exam one. It says that, uh, mention two organs, I guess, functions of the organs. Okay, maybe it's wrong. It just acts on the stomach then, is that it? Because I saw lower yeah. stomach as well, I thought. Maybe I heard that in the video. Mm, possibly. I'm not 100% sure on that one. Like, even this image that I have here, this is what I was, like, clicking through to look. Uh, it's really just asking on, or it's just acting on the stomach, it shows. Okay, I think I just read the question now that I'm looking at it. It's just, it said state two functions, but I guess I must have got that from somewhere else. But thank you. Uh, so, that, okay, so yeah, two functions. It's acting on chief cells, it's acting on parietal cells, and then I believe, I think that's it. And then just, yeah, I think that's what it's asking for. All right, welcome. Uh, enterogastric reflex, so this is just when the du duodenum is receiving food, um, we're moving on to that portion of like digestion, it says to the stomach, okay, go ahead and shut down. Um, so this is a sympathetic reaction because think about it, fight or flight, the stomach should not be working. That's not a, uh, a time for it. And it also will increase CCK and it will increase secretin. So the enterogastric reflex is then um, technically upregulating this process of shutting down the acid, getting ready to break the food down so that we can absorb it. All right, so as far as stomach goes, we have, uh, yeah, uh, control of the stomach. Um, we have cephalic phase, gastric phase, intestinal. So we were just talking about gastric and intestinal. We didn't really talk about cephalic. So with cephalic, what's happening here, this is kind of like if you guys took psych, you know, Pavlov, this is what it, it's the same effect, all right? Seeing, thinking about, smelling, any of that tasting food all stimulates gastric secretion and all of this to upregulate. Um, and start to have his activity. So the hypothalamus senses it, uh, sends signal through the medulla, then vagus, and we get that gastric activity. Uh, even the tasting has an effect too. So one of the big things, like I used to love Coke Zero. I still love Coke Zero, but I've gotten off caffeine, so the struggle is real. Uh, but that stuff can be dangerous because of this situation, the cephalic, for example. Your taste buds, when they taste sweet, your pancreas will start to release insulin. Insulin will drive down your glucose levels in your bloodstream. So what happens is in that situation when you don't eat something with your Coke Zero or something that is a synthetic sweetener and you don't consume actual sugar with it, your blood glucose level drops, 
and then uh, that can end up sending a uh, signal to the brain that you must consume food and you end up overeating, you eat excess calories then. So it's just something to keep in mind with that stuff. Um, and it's all because of basically cephalic phase. Uh, gastric, we just talked about this. So ran through all of this. I don't think there's anything else on here. Um, oh, it, it can sense amino acids. That's the only other thing on here that we didn't talk about. And that can affect the gastric phase to upregulate. So, you know, we'll produce more acid, pH will lower, and we start breaking things down. So there's the gastrin. Um, acetylcholine also plays a role in here because of the vagus nerve. And that's where that's coming from. And then intestinal phase, this is what we were just talking about when the chyme is entering duodenum. And we start to combat that with secretin and cholecystokinin. All right, so here we have a parietal cell. Uh, and what we're showing here is how do we get how do we get things from inside the cell out? So, or who acts on it? So gastrin, that upregulates uh, hydrogen chloride production. All right, where does gastrin come from? Where does gastrin come from? G cells, which are in the stomach. All right, oh, I can highlight. Can you guys see when I highlight like this? Oh, you can't see that? Oh, that's annoying. That's new. This new thing. I maybe throw my computer against the wall. All right. Acetylcholine coming from the nerve. Ha! Ah, I can do that. I bet you can see that. All right. Um, and then, okay. I'll figure it out. And then histamine. Um, where's histamine coming from? Paracrine to neighboring cells, so other parietal cells. Um, sorry, uh, not parietal cells, uh, enterochromaffin cells, uh, like cells, yes. Thank you. Um, so histamine, so paracrine means neighboring cells were chemical, chemical transmitters or chemical agents that communicate cell to cell uh, in the neighboring area, so right next to each other, that's paracrine. And I want you to remember this reaction here. We're at the very bottom here, okay? So much easier to just use the pen. This guy here, I need you to remember this because we're going to use this a couple times throughout the semester. We're going to talk about it when we talk about uh, in the red blood cell and the lungs, uh, you know, at the tissue level, exchanging uh, carbon dioxide. How do we get rid of it? How do we get rid of hydrogen ion? Why do we breathe it out? And then also in the kidneys, we will talk about it because we urinate out hydrogen ion. So you do need to know this reaction. So we take water plus carbon dioxide. Uh, we combine it, we make bicarb, and then we generate hydrogen ion. We can secrete the hydrogen ion out plus chloride. They combine in the stomach to make HCl. Okay. But this bottom area here, start. you need to commit it to memory. We're going to reapply it a couple times. All right, uh, this is a nice little image of everything we've just been talking about, where everything works, the different uh, hormones. So you want to snap a picture or something, you guys can have it. All right, so here is another way to look at this image of when we release CCK from the duodenum here. Right, so it's going into the bloodstream and then where it affects. So it affects pancreas, it affects liver, it affects gallbladder. Sure. Welcome. So CCK released from duodenum, enters bloodstream, affects pancreas, affects liver, affects gallbladder. So in the in the pancreas or bicarb, in the gallbladder and the uh, liver, release of bile. Oh, sure. It's like covering everything. Your 
rotations. There we go. All right, small intestine. We're going to talk about three areas: duodenum, jejunum, and ileum. When CCK reduces, is that when the gallbladder? Yes, the contractions will end then. Sure. So when C fat plays a big role in that, we don't talk about that. We just say when chyme enters the duodenum, but the fat content definitely plays a big role in it. Um, in the release of CCK. So the fattier the food, the more CCK. Once the food is basically cleared, the duodenum CCK should reduce and um, gallbladder will stop contracting. There's only diseases where there's like you don't generate bile from the liver um, or, you know, stones, stuff like that. <clears throat> so small intestine, uh, duodenum, jejunum and ileum. That's the order that they go in. So the cancer causes like inflammation of the gallbladder, like when the gallbladder has cancer. It causes inflammation, and I think it just causes pain. That's it. But the pain is referred pain, so it's in like usually the right shoulder area um, or scapular area. That's it. It wouldn't cause it to contract continually. Yeah. Mm. Well. Good. All right, so duodenum, C-shaped, um, pretty unique little area. Okay? Uh, part of it is intraperitoneal, part is retroperitoneal. So that's why we say, oh, it has adventitia, it technically also has serosa. Um, <clears throat> and he has some unique features we're gonna look at through here. So with the duodenum, a uh, couple big things here. They have villi. Okay, well, we'll start. They have simple columnar epithelium. The mucosa has villi, which are the bigger folds. And then on the surface of those folds are microvilli. Those are the little fingers, the little brush border. That's where we keep those enzymes sitting in there. When we have folds of submucosa and mucosa, that's plicae circularis. So by doing this, it gives us all these folds, it gives us more surface area, more time to absorb, more time to, or to have enzymes work on everything, slow it down. Um, the fingers, it helps rotate everything. It helps get more surface contact with the food uh, so that we can break it down into the monomers and so that we can absorb it. On the surface, we must have goblet cells because we must have mucus, all right? We talked about the enteroendocrine cell and then there's two other new features here. We have panith cells. We've heard of these, but we didn't know we heard of them. Why? Because they have lysozyme. And we said any bodily secretion pretty much has lysozyme in it. So here in the GI tract, we also produce lysozyme. Lysozyme primarily works on, anyone know? Gram positive or gram negative? There's my former micro people. <clears throat> micro positive. Thank you, okay, gram positives. So those gram negatives, it's not gonna work so well on. So in the event something has made it through, made it through the acid, it's a gram negative. That's probably what's gonna cause your illness. That's why you see E. coli is a big causative agent of traveler's diarrhea, for example. It's just very popular, very common, okay. Um, and then lacteals, we mentioned lacteals with, uh, with fat. So lacteals are lymphatics and they're where we're gonna absorb fat into. So pretty neat image here. 
you can see the folds, right? This is one of the big folds. See, these are all, it's, it, I love how it marks these as goblet cells only. This guy is also a goblet cell. Any of these guys through here are going to be goblet cells. They just don't have a mucus vacuole in here. All right. Intestinal crypts or crypts of Liberkuhn are these areas. It is not down inside the tissue. It is not down in here. All right. It's just a pocket between the villi. So crypts are down in here. Crypts of Liberkuhn, right? That's down in there. I always get students that get confused by that. So submucosa, another um, feature that we have are Bruner's glands. So in the submucosal tissue here, I think this, eh, it's not the best image of it. Let me see if I can't remember if I have an image of it or not. I guess right here, let me clear this. These would technically be Bruner's down in here. Right, there's little pockets of them. You guys will look at them in lab. They're clearer in lab. So Bruner's, Bruner's are great because we have all this acid coming into the duodenum. So Bruner's produce tons of bicarb and this helps, uh, or a mucus bicarb, I should say specifically. And so this helps protect the surface of the duodenum so it does not get damaged. Um, so that plays an important role in there. So that's one of our unique features here, is Bruner's. That is unique to duodenum. Then we have musculus external like before, and we said adventitious since he travels out of the peritoneum, technically retro. So what enters into the duodenum? We mentioned time, right? Coming from the stomach, it's the food mixed with the acid. We mentioned bile coming from the common bile duct from the gallbladder and the liver, and then pancreatic juice coming from the pancreatic duct right here, and then combining an ampulla of water, and then entering through sphincter of odi into the duodenum. So where do we break everything down? We've mentioned all of these fats. That's going to use lipase coming from the pancreas, carbs, amylase from the salivary glands, but primarily from the pancreas, and then proteins that are activated zymogens that we talked about. Um, so our trypsinogen, our chymotrypsinogen, and our procarboxypeptidase. So remember, uh, trypsinogen is activated by enterokinase into trypsin. And then the, here they say enteropeptidase, same thing, enterokinase, enteropeptidase. And then trypsin activates chymotrypsinogen into chymotrypsin. And trypsin also activates procarboxypeptidase into carboxypeptidase. All right, jejunum, that's for absorption. Uh, and also he has brush border enzymes like dipeptidase and stuff like that. So they call him the fine tuner. Gets that last little bit broken down. That's jejunum. <clears throat> All right, as far as the histology here, he's pretty much the um, same as duodenum for mucosa. Submucosa, he has plicae circularis, but no more Bruners. No more Bruners. Muscularis externa is the same. And then he has serosa because he's intraperitoneal. He's not retroperitoneal. Oh, I made a boo-boo today. I was supposed to look, record the lecture. That is my bad, I forgot. Can you guys remind me next lecture? I'm gonna start recording our lectures. 
because we, I believe we're the only online AMP2 and because students have had to quarantine, I'm, I'm supposed to record it. Yeah, they gave me the okay to do it. Um, just remind me, okay? <clears throat> I completely forgot. No brush quarter. Jejunum, jejunum has brush quarter enzymes, dipeptidases, stuff like that that we have mentioned. By the way, that doesn't mean you guys uh, only did you I mean, brush the brush border enzymes are also in the duodenum. It's just he has some here, too. What's the significance? Um, it goes back to embryology. It has to do with embryology because actually when all of this is formed, uh, it actually leaves the abdominal area and it folds external of the body and comes back in and then the formation of like the pancreas is actually two parts and it allows it to swivel apart or swivel around. It has to do embryology. For us, just know that one is intraperitoneal and the other is not. That's all. Yeah, only parts of the duodenum are retro. Does the entire small intestine have brush border? I want to say yes. Um, I want to say ilium also has some. I don't know that we mention them, though. I think we only talk about duodenum and jejunum. Adventitia. Dominique, Dominique, the answer there would be duodenum. Since he's retro, he would have adventitia. So our disaccharidases, the lactase through grace, maltase, we mentioned this, and then dipeptidases. Those are your brush border enzymes that you'll find in the jejunum. So it can, you're more likely to have more brush border enzymes in jejunum, I would say, because of the acid coming out of the stomach, um, because it would damage these potentially. So by now we've neutralized it. It makes sense to have them in the jejunum. By the way, yeah, if I'm going to record, that doesn't mean you guys can skip, okay? You're not going to do well. If you sit and just record me and try and watch it later, it's not the same. It's not the same interaction. So don't don't go skipping. Yeah, yeah, Danielle, I, I would agree with that. You know, that's where most of the absorption is happening. So it makes sense. That's the last point where we break it down into the monomers. So it makes sense for all of that to be together. All right, ilium. So with the ilium, we have a unique feature here, Peyer's patches or Peyer's patches uh, in the mucosa. So it's these big guys right here. And they are also not only in the mucosa, they actually also penetrate into submucosa. Um, they, they migrate through the tube, all right? And Basically what they are, they're lymphatic cells. They are lymphocytes. So they're like B cells, for example, the macrophages. And the reason we have them here is the next stop is large intestine where all the bacteria is. So if stuff migrates backwards, we sample it and we can create immunity against it. So there's thought also that it helps just constantly stimulate our immune system so it doesn't get lazy. Um, so that's why we have it there. So this is also referred to as GALT or gut associated lymphatic tissue um, that you can have there. And you can have it throughout the GI tract. It's just here, every person has it kind of situation. And then it's muscular, it's external like normal and it's serosa because it's intraperitoneal. We talked about peristalsis, we talked about segmentation. So remember peristalsis is just movement, segmentation is churning the food so that there can be um, more absorption or more contact with for chemical digestion. We looked at that slide before. All right, large intestine. <clears throat> Sorry, you may need that for a second. So large intestine, we're gonna talk about this. It's very basic. Really the big thing is formation of feces some absorption of water, and then just moving the waste out. So 
So small intestine is coming along. We hit cecum or ileocecal valve, I should say, first. And then we hit cecum. And then we hit um, hanging off the cecum here. We have the appendix. And then we hit the ascending colon. Um, so ascending, transverse, descending, sigmoid, and then rectum, anus. Uh, so everything in here basically is waste at this point. But we do extract some water from here. So you'll notice because we're not absorbing food, we're not absorbing nutrients, there's no more villi. There's no need for that. It's just simple columnar. There's goblet cells for mucus production for lubrication so that the stool can move. There's lymph nodes because we're in close contact with a lot of bacteria. Submucosa is your standard. Muscularis externa is your standard, except for tinea coli. Ugh, I covered that horribly. <laughs> Let me clear that. Uh, tinea coli. Okay, this guy down here. Where's my pen? There we go. Tinea coli. I know, I know, I'm working on it. Oh, I can do this, hold on, hold on. Ah, oh, I'm learning, I'm learning. One day, one day I'll get it right. Ha, look at that, high tech, okay. Um, <coughs> um, so tinea coli, these are a unique feature. So it, it is going across the transverse colon. Um, and it really, it's going across all of it, but you can really see it on the transverse colon here in the image. And what it creates are hostra or these puckers. So these are the little hostra, these little puckering of the tissue. Tinea coli is the line going across, it's a muscle going through there. And you only see this in living things. Why? Because the muscle is contracted then. Um, whereas in dead things, that's relaxed. So when you guys look at the cat, you can see hostra. And you should know that it would be there. You mean banded? You mean banded by the muscle? Is that what you mean? Tinea coli or by tinea coli? Um, no, it but it helps more with peristalsis. It's it's designed to help be like these giant areas that can flex together and help move move along. So it does relax and contract. Why are there so many goblet? It's just for lubrication. Help move the stool along because we're gonna start pulling all the water out, the last bit of water. We pulled most of it out already. We've actually pulled out about 90% already going through the ileum and jejunum. So we have very low water content. So that's why we need the mucus to help move. Uh, serosa, so transverse and sigmoid are serosa because they are intraperitoneal. And then ascending, descending, and rectum are adventitia. They are retroperitoneal. Correct, 90% in the jejunum. So we, leave, we take out 9% in the large intestine. We don't take out 100% because we need some moisture in there to help move it along. Um, and the bacteria need some moisture so that they can grow in there and help you uh, break things down. So 90% in the jejunum. 9% in the large intestine, we leave 1%. As far as feces go, it's either undigested food, you couldn't break it down, you ate too much, or it's just waste. It's things you couldn't break down, period. Um, we release bicarb in there. And the reason we do that is so we can pull salt back in. Right. Eat the corn, see the corn. <laughs> uh, 
All right. Um, so the the bacteria part of when they are breaking things down. If you guys have taken you know micro, we did like the you know you did the lactose sucrose uh, dextrose test. You know, and you read that there's a production of acid, right? And that's what turns that red to yellow when they break down those sugars. Uh, same thing in your body. So that's why we release bicarb because the organisms in there are producing um, producing acid, so it helps neutralize them. We need that bacteria because they make very important things for us, like vitamin K, um, and we need that for blood clotting. But they make vitamin B, so we can absorb some of that. We need it for different things in the body. Um, <clears throat> and it's epithelium, so you're always shedding epithelium. Uh, that's a given. And so cells come out, organisms come out with the stool or the feces, and you regenerate it all. Yeah, Danielle, water absorption, 9%. So it's not remove waste, it should be eliminate waste. Eliminate waste. When you say remove waste, you're implying that you're reabsorbing it into the bloodstream. So it should be eliminate waste. So the big thing is eliminate waste, remove water, and give a home for bacteria um, because we need that so we can generate the vitamin K, for example, vitamin B. Yes, expel waste, that works. So whenever we say like elimination, that means like we're getting rid of it out of the body. That's why it's used elimination, it's a common term. All right, um, so rectum, so defecation. So we have that inner sphincter, we mentioned him, uh, and that stretches, sends a uh, signal up, and that causes the external sphincter to um, to alert us, or for us to be alerted to voluntarily relax the external sphincter and defecate. Bilirubin? Yes, through the, through the bacteria, through the bacteria. Can I add more, what do you mean? What do you mean? What is the significance of breaking down bilirubin? Oh, the color? Oh, yeah, bilirubin, bilirubin adds color to your stool. Um, it makes it brown, or some of the green color can be attributed to that, too. Um, as it's oxidized, that's where the brown comes from, I believe. Um, but yeah. Uh, this is a neat chart. It's got everything broken down that we talked about. Um, and it breaks it down to where you can see it. One, one nice little area. If you want to stop the picture or anything, go for it. Flatus, it, gas, flatulence. Why do we have it? Why does it occur? A lot of the gas, so there's two reasons. One, the air that you ingest, right? That's that's one reason. The second bigger reason would be the bacteria, a byproduct of them undergoing like fermentation, for example, of things that they're eating is producing gas. Yeah. It's both. It really is both. Enteroendocrine, Rebecca. Endocrine. Yeah, 
we would ask enteroendocrine. Chemoreceptors, chemoreceptors would mean imply that they're just intaking chemical information. Sweet sour All right, accessory organs. Um, We've talked about some of these a little bit, but we go into further details with teeth, salivary glands, liver, gallbladder, and pancreas. Alicia, it's from the it's the fermentation process. So they are alive. They just they're what they're breaking it down and they're if you guys remember um uh, micro in micro when we talk about like fermentation, they're going through that process to generate ATP. The side effect is CO2 production and they can produce other gases also. All right, uh, tooth, and you guys go through this in lab also. Uh, enamel, so this is where the calcium is deposited, and that's what's hard, so it's the outer outer area here, the one in white here. Um, once you pass into dentin, this is softer. So when you go to the dentist and they say, oh, you have a cavity, and you're like, I don't feel anything, okay? That's because it is only in the enamel. When it is into the dentin, this is where it hurts when you eat something hot or drink something hot or something cold, or the dentist is evil and sprays like cold air on it. And you feel that. That's because the cavity has penetrated to the dentin. If it gets too deep into the dentin, eventually it's gonna enter into the pulp. The pulp is where you have your blood vessels, your nerves, and a portal to your bloodstream. Um, when it gets down to here, you must have a root canal. So if it's deep in the dentin or it reaches the pulp cavity, yeah, it hurts nonstop, um, extremely painful, and that's because those nerves are just exposed and you need a uh, root canal. So my evil dad, right, I had a cavity down into the dentin. He drilled it out and he's like, it's too fragile. I need to do a root canal on you. I'm like, cool, brah. Um, yeah, <laughs> there's a lot. People don't realize it. So I'm like, cool, let's do a root canal. My dad is evil, okay? He's evil. <laughs> just enjoys torturing his children, right? So he did a nerve block, which is further up here, and then a local right at the tooth. Um, and my mom and I are the same way. For some reason, the lidocaine, it just does not work well, on or novocaine does not work well on us. Um, so he's like drilling and I'm just, I'm in tons of pain. He's like, all right, let's give you another injection. So at this point he's, he's opened up, he's opened up the pulp. He's in here. So my dad takes a needle, he takes the needle tip, bends it like this. And I'm like, what you going to do with that? <laughs> he's like, just hold still. He takes the needle and injects right on the nerve. He hit the nerve. Like as he's injecting, he's got to get down in there and inject it. I almost jumped out of the chair. That was incredibly painful. It was evil. He lives for this stuff. But after that, didn't feel a thing. Why? Because now he's got the whole nerve signal shut down. That's what we're doing when we give uh, anesthetics. We're shutting off the nerve from sending a signal to the brain. Um, so yeah, that was not fun. And like other times he's numbed me up. And like one time I was in there, I'm like, I'm not numb. And he smacks me across the face. He's like, did you feel that? I was like, yeah. He's like, oh, okay, you're not numb. You're not numb yet. <laughs> what the hell? <laughs> Who can I call? <laughs> I told him I'm not paying. <laughs> uh, but yeah, so you got to, you got to protect your teeth because the problem is when you get infections down in here, the next stop usually is the heart. Uh, you can get infections on the heart valve. So protecting protecting your teeth is very important. Um, periodontal ligament, that is what actually attaches the tooth to the bone. And that is what, when you get a tooth removed, that's what you tear. Yeah, it hurts, right? <laughs> it's a little home, close to home. Uh, gingiva is the gums. And so that is the uh, um, stratified squamous that can become keratinized. There's lamina propria under here. 
And then lastly, crown is everything above the gum line. So that's why they put a crown on your tooth. That's what they are doing. They're crowning the tooth. Root is everything below the gum line. My youngest sister is also becoming a dentist. Obviously, that school had low standards, let her in. We give her a hard time. I think she's just she's in her fourth year. She just started her first, fourth year. It's, she's special. She's special. It's, uh, uh. <laughs> she's like, can we, can I work on your teeth? We're like, no, no. All of us have a running joke. We're like, so what day do you graduate? Okay, I'll get dental insurance that day. <laughs> So I can go to a regular dentist. <laughs> Pops, when are you when are you retiring? All right, I'll put dental insurance then. Oh man. But yeah. So the times. Uh salivary glands, we have three that we learn about. There are uh four. Um right. No, we learn about three. In lab, you only draw two. There we go. That's what I'm thinking of. That's so great. <laughs> They're always very critical of things. All right, so parotid gland on the sides here, in your cheeks here, this produces the watery mucus. Um, they can be clogged. My dad has told me before he has gone in there and had to pull little like calcium stones, stuff like that, salt stones out of there. Um, they can build up over time, like these little mineral stones and block them and they get this big swollen um, parotid gland. So when he pops that little stone out of there, it just drains all of a sudden. You'll see tons of saliva coming out. Uh, mumps affects it. So that's where you get mumps and bumps, all right? That's one of the swellings they get. Males can actually get testicular swelling and uh, sterility from mumps. So that's why it's important to vaccine or vaccinate. Warheads or lemon heads make it overproduce. That's that's actually a pretty smart way to do it. Yeah, if you make it overproduce, over secrete, it'll it can clear it. That's pretty nuts. Man, I miss warheads. <laughs> I've been seeing those. By the way, did y'all notice that uh, the um, sour skittles are gone? Looks like they pulled them off the market. I haven't seen I haven't seen sour skittles. I think they pulled them. Uh, so sublingual, this guy is more mucus rich. Okay, so parotid is watery, sublingual is mucus, submandibular is a mix of the two, and that's why you guys don't draw that one because it's a mix of different cell structures. They are exocrine, meaning they secrete out. You found them? I need to find them. I've been looking. I haven't found them. So exocrine, it secretes out. You guys should have covered in lab well by now. The acinus, serous acini are watery. Mucus acini are um, very mucusy, and so they don't stain well. That's why they appear white. Serous acinus appear dark. They stain well. And we have ducts that open into the mouth and carry it to the mouth. So as far as saliva goes, you produce a substantial amount, one to one and a half liters per day. Uh, what's in there? Amylase, mucus, lysozyme, antibodies, specifically IgA. We'll talk about that. Body secretions. And there are some ions. Overall, though, it is hypotonic. Overall, it is hypotonic. Why? Why is there very minimal ions in your saliva? Very minimal ions in your saliva. There's no NA, no. Give you a hint. There's no, oh, that is a big C. NACL. Why is there no NACL? Why is there no sodium? Why is it pretty pure water? Any other ideas? It's going to hydrate the mouth because we eat. Why, Brennan? We eat. It has something to do with eating. No, not the eating sodium. No. 
how well would your, how sensitive are you to sodium in your food? Taste wise, you can taste it real easy, right? So what happens if you started secreting stuff like sodium into your saliva? Would your, your uh, sensitivity to taste be very high? Yeah, taste buds. You wouldn't be able to taste things. In general, your ability to taste flavors would be altered. So by having like pure water basically come out in your saliva, our ability to taste and determine like flavor, stuff like that, good, bad, is, is stronger. And that's why when you're sick, you don't really taste anything because you don't secrete. The longest is going to be the parotid, the watery. Because if the mucus ones are very long, they get clogged. Okay. So when you're sick and you don't produce saliva, you don't produce mucus, you don't taste very well. That's why the whole like people going gung-ho with COVID and saying, well, if you can't taste, you have COVID. That's like the dumbest comment ever to come out about in a viral uh, upper respiratory infection. All upper respiratory infections pretty much dry you out. That's why you lose your appetite when you're sick. Okay. You lose the lack of smell, you lose the lack of taste. Exactly. If you can't smell, you can't taste. Like 80% of our ability to taste comes from our sense of smell. Both systems, both systems have to have secreted mucus. If mucus is not there, the chemicals cannot saturate into the mucus. You can't smell, you can't taste. It's not just COVID, it is all upper respiratory infections. Think about it when you were a kid. Um, when you're a kid, you can't, uh, you lose your appetite when you're sick and they always would make you stuff that's super salty, like chicken noodle soup, right? A lot of the soups, very spicy, not very spicy, but very um, flavorful foods and trying to get you to eat that because you don't have a sense of taste. Some people, it's gonna be more than others. That's just a given with in length duration of the infection will definitely have an effect on that. And then what medications you're using, that also plays a role in it. Stuff like Flonase, um, things that dry you out, that's gonna have a greater effect too. Um, fever, I mean, if you have a fever, you probably have something that's drying you out also. Submandibular. So are the submandibular going to make a majority? No, no, they don't make a majority. I believe the parotid actually make the majority. They're the largest. Could be parotid. All right, guys, we'll stop there. We're a little bit behind, but we're not too behind. We'll, we'll, we'll make it up. I'm not worried. Ms. Sorachi? Yeah, Dr. Nickham, I'm like confused uh, mm -hmm. about the submandibular gland because in the mm -hmm. book, like I thought it was the parietal gland who makes more saliva, but in the book, yeah, yeah. they say the submandibular, so I'm like... It is submandibular. Um, it's yeah. fine. I've seen a question that asks which, is, which produces more than the other. I wouldn't worry about that. Okay, thank God. All right, <laughs> thank yeah, you. Yeah, I wouldn't worry about that. Just right. know what they produce. I think that's more important, where they're located, what they produce. That's more important. All right. All right, guys. Enjoy the rest of your day. I will see you guys on Wednesday. Um... We'll, we'll get we'll get caught up. No worries. Remind me to record on Wednesday. All right. See you guys. Email me if you need me. Hey, Dr. Knockwood, Marisa. Hey. Uh, you want me hey. to send you the link from my recording? So I was thinking about it when when we send the link. Doesn't that just open up the actual like? pull them into the chat, not to where they can see the recordings? No, I think you can see the video. It, it, it's the video, it, the, the chat is there too. Um, at least when I- If you see the live, like what we're looking at now, they don't see the page before that where you can select the recordings, right? What do you mean? Like where you access the recordings, which is on the, here, let me just do this uh share where's my share my screen because like it's going to bring up like where we're sitting at now i was thinking about that after i made the comment about i'm supposed to record so like they don't see here like they don't see this no. where they actually 
Yeah, yeah so recording. Uh huh. When you go to what you just did the recording, um, mm -hmm. the what, the link just goes to a video of basically whatever was being shown in the Blackboard window. So, like it 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 it's like from the perspective of a participant, if that makes sense. Oh, so you can actually send them the actual recording, is what you're saying? Yeah. Oh, okay, cool. That's what I've been doing for workshops and things like that. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, let's go ahead and do that. And then it really it needs to go to um, it needs to go to Leslie. Okay. Why? Yeah. Maybe has students who need it. Yeah, yeah. I think there's like eighteen of them. Okay, I can do that. Um, sure. I'll I'll do that. And I'm going. I don't know. I'm I'm in like different order. I'm doing mine in a different order than you're doing. So today we're mm -hmm. talking about the, like the small intestine, kind of in order of the lecture notes. Um, That's fine. So, yeah. yeah, I'll just cool. do that. And I'll, so Leslie Minor is the one who needs it. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I mean, realistically, they have Kathy's videos, so I don't think it's that big of a deal, but <laughs> that's fine. We just, we wanted to make sure they're not missing out on anything. Yeah, for sure. Okay, I can do that. Yeah, I'm recording. This is my last week online because husband got COVID, so yeah, I'm stuck in the house through no fault of my own. Yeah, I, had, I just had six in my micro class. I had um, one one come in that was, ended up being tested positive, so oh, I'm in there. I've, I sent the link to them for Ozon's class, so. Okay. Yeah, it's nuts. It's crazy because we're all vaccinated and it just like slammed into his family. Like his parents got it, he got it, my son got it, like everybody got it. And it's really mild because we're all vaccinated, but it's still crazy. Yeah. Like, yeah, my student that got it is vaccinated. Yeah. So all the others that had to quarantine were not. Yeah, yeah. Oh, time. dude. All right. I know. All right. Thank Bye. you. Bye. See ya.